Hey, what's going on everyone? I hope you all are having a great week. This video is going to be the follow-up video to my Come Fish Pyramid Lake invitation video. So we're going to cover the things like who, what, when, why, like where we went, what we did, setups, rigs, what worked and what didn't. Now, I don't believe in gimmicks to hold a captive audience. So if you're not interested in the gory details, you can go right to the chase toward the end of the video and I'll give you a summary encapsulation as to where you should go and what you should fish. Okay, so let's begin by talking about where. The destination is Pyramid Lake. Now there appears to be two Pyramid Lakes. The first one is in Southern California, about 40 minutes away from LA, and that's what we're talking about. There appears to be another Pyramid Lake, and this one is in Nevada, and people are catching fish like this. So I should let you know, this is not that lake, and I am not this fisherman. <laughs> okay, going back to our Pyramid Lake, let me just give you a visual overview of what you can expect. So Pyramid Lake is a pretty big lake. So if you launch from the marina around here and paddle all the way to the dam, Okay, it's about 2.7 miles as the crow flies, but by the time you throw in a couple of turns and twists, it's gonna be about a three mile paddle one way. Getting to the lake is pretty straightforward, but there are a couple of exits associated with Pyramid Lake. The first exit will get you to the visitor center, and that's not the one you want. You wanna go past that one and then get off on Smoky Bear Road. Okay, and that exit will get you to the marina and the boat dock. Now, before you can even think about launching your vessel, whether it's a boat or a kayak, I need to give you a very important heads up. So let me zoom in here. There is going to be an inspection station. And I think this is it right here. And this is before you, you can even enter the lake. So you need to stop here. Um, some people are going to inspect your vessel. If you're in a kayak, they're going to look inside the hull. And the best advice I can give you is make sure the inside of your hull is bone dry because they're super vigilant about the quagga muscle. This guy. So getting past the inspection is the hard part. The rest of it is pretty straightforward. Again, I'm making this video early February 2020, and this picture, of course, is static. So um, if you watch this video in 2021, etc., do your due diligence. Um, let's see, no fishing allowed within 100 feet of the launch ramp, which makes sense. You don't want to do that anyways. Fishing limit, 10 strippers per day, 10 catfish, 5 trout, 5 bass. Um, this might be kind of important if you fish during the winter time and you're interested in trout. Uh, trout are cold water fish and I think they only plant them during winter and early spring. So the last plant was 124.20. Okay, so that's about two weeks prior to this video. Not ideal, but it is what it is. And I'll leave a link to a, um, a site, the DFNG or whatever they call it now, like Department of Wildlife, where they can uh, show you the trout plant schedule. So if you're after trout, that's gonna play a key role. Okay, at this point, let me get back to Google Earth, zoom in here and show you how and where to launch. So zooming in. So here are the important takeaways. There is a power plant here and I do believe that they can determine how much water and how quickly the water gets let out. Kind of like the Black Canyon and the Hoover Dam, but on a smaller scale. I'm gonna pan out. This is the main parking lot, okay? And this is where all the boaters with their trailers will park. This is the launch ramp right here. And if you take this road up and go here, okay, there is a general store so you can go over here and pick up bait and maybe some fishing essentials you know sunscreen etc okay we have arrived at pyramid lake about 7 30. one thing to note is it is always cold over here i mean it's at least 10 15 degrees colder than you would experience in la so be aware of that so it looks like most of the early 
Blackbird boaters have launched. And I don't mind that. I don't mind giving them about 10, 20 minutes from uh, lake opening so that we don't tie up anyone at the launch ramp and uh, get anyone upset. Now, let me take the time to interject here because I may be able to save you some aggravation. So if you're a casual, you know, recreational kayak fisherman like myself, understand that this lake during the winter months, and I think it changes March 10th. So during the winter months, the lake will open at 7 a.m. And around, I don't know, like 6 a.m., 6.30, there will be boaters who get in line at the gates to get in. So my assumption is this. If you're going to wake up um, when it's cold in the middle of winter, and stand in line to get into a lake when the fishing is more or less slow you're kind of a hardcore fisherman and the point is those types of fishermen some can sometimes be impatient okay now i don't believe in deferring to everyone at every point but at the same time i don't believe like you should go looking for confrontation either so it's like bruce lee said be water my friends so if you don't want to run the risk of a confrontation at 7 a.m. in the morning and for safety factors too, give the boaters about 30 minutes to launch and do their thing. Even if you're vying for the same spot, they're going to beat you there with their 200 horsepower motors anyways. So there's the launch ramp. And again, this is mid-February, but look how very little boat traffic there is. And I really appreciate that about this lake. I'm gonna drag my kayak down to the ramp and then launch and we'll see what happens. Let me pause the video here and give you some more advice. This ramp is steeper than the action camera portrays. And on top of that, if some boaters have launched ahead of you, the ramp might be wet. So I would go down this ramp with the kayak leading and not with you leading and you'll have to use your imagination. That way, if you slip and fall, the kayak isn't going to get out of control. If you are leading and you slip and fall, the kayak is first of all going to want to run you over, which is not a big deal. But in your efforts to save it, the kayak might get sideways and then tip over and dump all your stuff onto the ramp. Okay, before we launch, I want to talk about a general game plan. Like, first of all, where do we want to go? So initially, you know, I'm gonna gravitate toward going where people don't want to go. This is a huge lake. So from at the longest point, from point to point, it's gonna be about three miles. Um, but if you want to hang out like around here, this is what I'm thinking. So first of all, I think you're not allowed to fish like within a hundred feet of the uh, marina, which makes sense. And you don't want to be hanging out here anyways because of the boat traffic and safety. So on the left-hand side, Okay, there's boat rental, there are picnic tables. I don't know if you can see it. There's a beach. So that tells me that there's gonna be a lot of foot traffic there and fishing pressure. On the right hand side, you're seeing more of a sheer cliff. And right off the bat, I'm thinking that's not going to see as much fishing pressure or foot traffic. So I'm gonna gravitate toward there. Um, beyond that, it's mid February. So everything that I've kind of seen in red tells me that the fish are going to be hungered down in deeper water. So when you see a sheer wall, you can imagine the wall extending down quickly and steeply into deeper water. Whereas here, you have a gradual kind of a beach. And so for those two reasons, I'm kind of leaning toward checking out this area first. So visually, we have just launched our kayaks here and we've made the decision to fish this steep wall here as opposed to this presumably gradual beachy area here. Now you have to understand that this is just guesswork based on timing. And when I say timing, I'm talking about time of year. When the water's cold, the presumption is they're hanging out, hunkered down in deeper water. In March, who knows? the script can completely flip and maybe the fish move towards shallower water in an effort to find spawning ground. So again, take into account the timing. So anyways, we're going to launch and head in this general direction. Now I got to give you a heads up here because this 
it's more than a creek and it's less than a big river we'll call it like a little river so this little river is going to wash down a lot of sediment and it will collect around here so what i found out was this area is very shallow some of it was under two foot so the heads up is if you ride a hobie with a mirage drive and a rudder you don't want either item touching down in this area so you've got to be careful and then we navigated past this section and then there was a drop off here and we ended up in water that was around 14 15 feet deep gosh there is so much to talk about i mean like where do we even start um so in terms of gear it's going to be a completely different ball game of course and by that i mean not only the rods and reels that's obvious but this fish finder is not the same fish finder that i run in the ocean in the ocean i run the echo map 64 cv and this is the 73 cv so with the garmin echo map lineup okay only for the echo map lineup the second number denotes what the application is for so if the second number is a three that's going to be a freshwater um, echo map unit which means that it's going to have contour lines for fresh water if the number is a four that's an oceanic unit and it's going to have contour maps for the ocean beyond that there are transducer implications and i'm going to probably cut in here and give you a more detailed in-depth discussion so this picture right here will illustrate the differences in terms of transducers so this transducer up on top is for an ocean echo map unit look how much bigger it is than the transducer on the bottom which is fresh water now i'm not an engineer but my assumption is you're dealing with a denser medium in salt water right salt water being more dense than fresh water and the other assumption is you're going to be in deeper water in general in the in the open ocean so you're going to need a transducer that has more pop to get that signal way down in deeper water now here's the other area where the transducers may differ okay so on the bottom here you have the freshwater transducer and again the implication is you're going to be in shallower water so the beam okay coming out of the freshwater unit is going to be wider okay because again you're in shallower water and you need to cover as much ground as possible if you're in deeper water in the ocean the beam is going to be narrower because by the time a narrow beam gets down to like 100 feet 200 feet 300 feet it's going to be the right size in terms of diameter for your application so think of it as a flashlight you know a modern day flashlight where you can adjust the angle of the beam right so if you're in the dark and you're looking for something at your feet you want to adjust the flashlight beam angle for a very wide you know uh, throw if you're focusing on something let's say 100 yards away 200 yards away you want to narrow down that throw or that beam so you can focus in on something far away i hope that makes sense so it's warming up finally <laughs> and it's going to be nice and the wind is very very calm out here with a, a youtube buddy and so first place we're going to check out is along the sheer walls here and uh, see what we can mark okay so this video is running long and it's gonna run longer so at this point i might as well take the time to answer a question that i do field on occasion and it goes something like this hey why do we not see your face in your youtube videos and the answer to that is number one i'm very private by nature and number two i was involved in an industrial accident as a child so my image isn't going to add anything in terms of content so there's that so as i mentioned this is a 73 cv so in theory it should come with contour maps of freshwater bodies now pyramid lake is a big lake it's um, again almost three miles from point to point but apparently it's not included as part of the echo map map charting system but that's okay because it does have the uh the feature where we can create our own contour maps so here quick draw contours start recording okay 
So that means that when you turn that feature on, as you paddle along, you're going to create your own maps, which is a very useful feature. And again, with contour lines, um, if you don't have big structures like shipwrecks and, and huge underwater mountains, then you look for changes in elevation, and that's what the contour lines will tell you. Okay, so here's how this feature works. Okay. As we paddle along, it's dropping down these contour lines here. So we're in really shallow water, <laughs> obviously. So you've got to be heads up about the Mirage Drive. But look at the contour lines that it's mapping out. Very key. Yikes. I'm going to have to pull up the rudder and the Mirage Drive here. So the way the contour lines work is they give you a visual representation of changes in elevation. So you see this drop, you see this deep drop off right here? That is here, where the lines are stacked tight together. There's either a drop off or an incline. Now this is more interesting, right? These arches could represent fish. It's possible. It's hard to tell because again, this is kind of like a new ballpark for me, but those could be fish. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm gonna drop the uh, little buoy marker here and we will see what they're about. So obviously this scene right here is very interesting. I'm about 95% sure that these are fish. Now the question is, if you're fishing in a new body of water, what kind of fish are they? And the more you do this, the more time you spend on the water and the more time you spend looking into your sonar screen, the better you will become at it. And not every arch is created equal and sometimes a fish won't even represent as an arch. But Arches can be like long and thinnish, they can be uh, kind of short and tallish. So it's just a matter of getting a feel by just being out on the water. And by virtue of spending time on the water, you'll realize that every fish will have a certain signature, if you will. Okay, so again, brand new to this ball game, but uh, all the YouTube videos that I've been watching, assuming those arches are bass, okay, the Ned Rig appears to be pretty effective. So that's what I'm going to throw first. Um, this setup here is seven foot, probably like medium, 2,500 size reel, um, probably about 10, 15 pound main braid. And this is four pound line here. And with the line weight, I, I'm of the philosophy it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. So I kind of feel like a lot of the times if you throw a lighter line, you're going to get more action. You will also break off a bunch, but um, it's a trade-off. So we're going to try light line first. And so I've been told I should just cast it out. Okay. And I'm going to let it sink to the bottom. We're in about 14 feet of water here. And either dead stick it or just drag it along the bottom super slow. And again, I don't know that these are bass. So maybe they're catfish. In which case, we may want to try some bait. I have some night crawlers, which is kind of like the universal bait. So here is the reality for most of us. Unless you are a super talented fisherman, in which case, I'm assuming you're not watching this video. If you go out to a new body of water, fresh water in Southern California with all the traffic, in the middle of winter, there's a very good chance that you're not going to see a lot of action. Truth be told, these fish by the marina have probably seen every form of bait or lure thrown at them. Okay, so um, again, I don't know if they're catfish or bass or whatever they are, but I'm going to try the universal bait, which is uh, the night crawler that I picked up at the Pyramid Lake store. Here, let me take the time to diagram the bait rig of choice for me. In general, I kind of feel like bait will typically outfish lures like jigs and whatnot. With the possible exception of the Berkeley gulp stuff. Berkeley is definitely onto something over there. Anyways, let's go back to the bait setup. And the rig of choice for me is the Carolina rig. I'm sure you've all heard of it before. The red line represents the main line, which for me is braid. Uh, you should be fishing braid too. The orange circle is the sliding egg sinker. 
the purple circle is some form of a bead. And then the green figure eight is a swivel. And the leader, again, I like fishing as light a line as I can get away with. So in this situation where I'm not dealing with structure and you know branches and things of that nature, I'm fishing four pound leader. And then this hook might be, you know, size six maybe, might be a good universal hook size. And so I kind of feel like the Carolina rig is, for bait fishing, it represents the best combination of ease of rigging and efficacy. And by ease of tying, I mean that you don't have to know any fancy leader to braid line connection knots like the FG knot or the modified Albright knot, okay? You just tie one end to one eye of the swivel and then you just tie the other line to another eye of the swivel. And most likely, if you break off, you're gonna break off on a leader. So it's just a matter of retying another section of leader. Piece of cake. However, no rig is perfect. And so the Carolina rig has a couple of drawbacks. Okay, drawback number one is this. It's hard to quickly switch out the weight here, the X anchor, if conditions change, right? So if you wanna fish deeper water and you need heavier weight, you're gonna to have to break this setup and then hopefully insert a heavier X anchor. And on top of that, X anchors can only go up to what, like three ounces, four ounces. And in the ocean, you might need 12 ounces and I've never seen a 12 ounce X anchor. The other drawback is this. If you're in the ocean and you wanna fish more than one hook, so for example, you're after rockfish and you want a rig that has two hooks. In Southern California, you're allowed maximum of two hooks. Then you have to go to a double dropper loop rig. So that's the other drawback to the Carolina rig. It's not, you can't have multiple hooks. So to get around drawback number one, I deploy this guy. Okay, so one of the setups that I have is kind of like a, a Carolina rig with a twist. I'm not sure if this rig has a name. So typically you'll have like a sliding egg sinker here. And in its place, I have kind of like a sliding swivel. And the uh, flexibility that this gives me, I like over the Carolina rig because I can always take off this quarter ounce egg sinker and replace it with something heavier if I'm in deeper water. So at this point, we decide to pick up and start roaming. Okay, so we're a party of two and that gives us the freedom and the flexibility to do whatever we want, go wherever we want. And as I mentioned, this is a big lake. So I'm thinking that we're gonna go to the very end, to the dam. And then at that point, we're gonna be fairly assured that those fish haven't seen the kind of pressure that the fish near the marina have seen and then maybe work our way back. So wind always plays a factor. So as I'm paddling out, I'm always aware. And so we have a very light wind. You might be able to see some of the ripples and it's in my face as I'm paddling away from the marina. So if the pattern holds true and I, and I don't know that it will, then it implies that on the way back, we're going to have a tailwind, which is always very nice. Here's an example of an interesting kind of a screen. This right here, we've got a whole bunch of arches stacked together and you would think that they're fish, but I don't think so because it's just, it's too uniform. So I'm gonna guess this is some kind of a structure, you know, maybe like a fallen tree or something. When it's that uniform, um, it's generally not fish. This is an interesting scene, right? These are fish but they're active. They're moving up and down the column here. You know, I'm guessing that they're stripers, but it's deep, you know, it's like 90 feet. Yeah, so tantalizing. We're deep, 115 feet of water, but I can see fish hanging out near the bottom. I just, <laughs> I don't know what they want. So I've got a little heavier sinker, maybe like one ounce, and I uh, put a night crawler down there, but they're not having it. Here I'm going to have to narrate over the original audio because of the wind noise, but if we were in the ocean in 261 feet of water and I were to see that impressionist painting mound, I would immediately think rockfish, prime rockfish habitat. Okay. 
Dad and I are making quick work of this paddle. We're almost at the dam. Uh, we're averaging over three miles per hour into a light headwind. Over three miles per hour in a Hobie is not that impressive, but in a paddle kayak, that is pretty impressive. So good for us. So in under an hour, we find ourselves near the dam. Be mindful here because you cannot fish within 500 feet of the dam structure for obvious reasons. So at this point, we decide to work the left hand side, uh, the shoreline, and we let the wind kind of push us back toward the marina. Okay, the other setup that I kind of like for freshwater are these really tiny gulp minnows. And I've got them on a really light, could be like a 130 second jig head. And um, these aren't gonna catch big fish, but this is another setup that's supposed to be pretty productive for catching smaller fish. So we're gonna throw the kitchen sink at them and see what happens. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of mirror the wall here and just blind cast and see what happens. Finally, Let's see what these are. Oh, this is a bigger fish. In this sequence, you see me lighten up in the drag a couple of times because number one, I'm fishing four pound line, it's pretty light. And then maybe more importantly, this fish has nowhere to hide because there's no structure underneath. So he could run 50 yards and he's not gonna wrap me around anything. So I can afford to take my time here. This is a big trout, I'm surprised. Last time they stocked this lake with trout was like January 24th. Okay, I've got four pound line on here. I gotta be delicate about this. Should have brought my net. I whip my hands. Okay, little planter trout, you can tell. Now this fish took me by surprise. I was not expecting to catch this here because when they plant and they planted a couple of weeks ago, I guarantee you they're not gonna let the fish go here they're gonna release them by the boat ramp. And so this fish was caught way over here. Let me zoom in. Okay, so I'm working this wall right here when I hook up to this fish. So that fish was caught right around here. But I gotta tell you, there was nothing especially different about this spot, you know, as opposed to this spot or this spot. The only distinguishing feature was that there was a little bit of a rock slide, but I don't think that was what was holding the trout. And I don't think trout are structure oriented to the same degree that bass or maybe crappie are. Regardless, you all know that I'm part of the unsecret society, right? I don't score a 35 a game, but I am one of the league leaders in assists, right? <laughs> So apparently this is what trout look like on a sonar. They don't represent as the classic horizontal arch, although this could represent their behavior on that particular day. They could be going up and down the water column, maybe looking for food. So here on the right, you can see the rock slide pile that I was referring to. With planter trout, um, typically about 90% of them get picked off right away by shore fishermen, boat fishermen. And then the remaining ones are smarter than the average bear and they're tougher to catch. And so we continued to fish this area along with others for the next few hours, but there just wasn't much action. Okay, wind is picking up. It kind of feels like it might be about 15, which was kind of predicted, but again, it is mostly blowing in the direction where I want to go when I'm done fishing, so I feel okay about that. At this point, we decide to start paddling back, but we're going to make a pit stop here in this 
what do you want to call it? Finger or cut out or whatever. So these little streaks are all fish. This blob right here is my nightcrawler rig. So they're swimming all around it. They're just not having it. Uh, it could be a function of time of day or whatever, but um, yeah, they're not in a biting mood right now. So in this cove, I see the very same pattern that I saw back near the dam where I picked up the planter trout. So again, the planter trout represent this kind of like longish question mark like arches with not much red. So let me zoom in here. So we are hanging out here fishing this little cove. This is the marina. We didn't have enough time to fish this cove, but this cove right here is not very far away from the marina. I threw the nightcrawler, I threw a Berkeley powerbait mousetail, a gulp alive minnow. Yeah, it just wasn't happening. At this point, it's about three o'clock and we need to think about easing back toward the marina. And we are paddling right around here when Okay, they're just lighting up the screen right here. And we, it's funny because we passed this area in the morning, but look at this. I mean, they're just everywhere now, okay? And uh, I'm gonna hit the waypoint. Again, I don't know. I mean, this might be completely just dynamic and not, you know, you may come back tomorrow or the week after or whatever, but look, they're just up and down the water column. Um, and maybe we just ran into them. They don't hang out here, but anyways, those are stripers. Look at the size of those marks. Them are big fish. Okay, keep our fingers crossed. Eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. Yeah. Here we go. Doesn't feel that big though. I might have caught the runt of the litter here. <laughs> See that or the fish are lethargic because the water is so cold, but it, it doesn't feel that big. But the graph does not lie. I've got four pound test on here, so I can't torse them in. Yeah, it's a striper. Not a very big one. You gotta be patient with them. Yeah, they're they're not very like hard charging because they're lethargic because the water's so cold. But anyways, here they are. Don't break the line, pal. I need you on video. Okay, here we go. So that's what the uh, the marks were eating. Um, he ate a night crawler. Again, you know, tough gig, but I imagine in the summertime, the uh, fishing action is going to kind of heat up. But anyways, there's the target. <laughs> All right, so tough day at the office. Uh, Bravo team and I were out there for probably like eight hours. I put two fish on the boat. Now then, this is the part of the video that I had been referring to when this video first kicked off. If you just want to come out here and you're not really interested in paddling and taking in scenery and you just want to catch fish, and I totally get it if you do, there's nothing wrong with that. I can probably summarize this in one minute. And here's what I would do. Get to the lake, launch your kayak, and right off the bat, you can probably eliminate, oh, about 95% of a lake. <laughs> If you are after trout, go during the winter time, the colder months, okay? Uh, keep track of the DFNG trout plant schedule and then they want, they're not going to tell you exactly the date, but they will tell you the week. So go during a week where they plant and then launch your kayak and fish one of these two coves and being in a kayak here offers a huge advantage right because you could actually just beach the kayak put up a lawn chair and soak Berkeley power bait right easy if you are after striper you don't even have to go this far just launch your kayak 
okay? And then look for the drop-off here. And if you don't have a fish finder, it's not really a problem. Like if you just put a weight down and just kind of feel the bottom, just look for a spot where the weight drops down further than um, it did a couple of casts ago. And then just basically work this area here and you could soak night crawlers. I've heard that anchovies and mackerel work as well. Okay, use the Carolina rig. You're not going to be dealing with, um, you know, great depth change. So you don't even need that fancy one where you can switch out the, uh, the, the weights. So that's how I would do it. And with that, I will bring this really long video to a conclusion. Hey, as always, thank you for tuning in. Get out there, have fun, and be safe, and we will see you soon on our next adventure. Bye for now.